this evening and I'm very, very, very happy and delighted to welcome a lady who is working tonight to speak to us. But before I introduce her, we have our usual protocol. We'll play her a song just to welcome her and relax her. I know she's been stressed all day probably getting calls from all over the world about Nigerians who have been trafficked to Libya, to Lebanon, to Dubai, to everywhere. And then they are calling on this lady to bail them out, to buy tickets. She will tell us all about it tonight. So let's start with our music and then I will introduce my special guests. And after her, we have yet another special guest from Moyo State, and uh, we'll talk to you about them later. I concur. I concur. <laughs> yes, our own team, Aya. <laughs> Yes, I wish we be that on, but then we have very, very serious business to discuss tonight. And uh, my very dear sister, it's good to see you again. I think the last time I saw you must have been years ago in South Africa. Yes. We met, <laughs> we met at the Oliver Tambo Airport in Joburg. As I was connecting a flight, I think you were also connecting a flight. So it's good to see you again. But I've been following you, I've been following your work, and uh, every time I see you, I just say, oh, I wonder how she's going to cope. Uh, we're live right now on Instagram, we're live on uh, Facebook, I can see a lot of my friends. Uh, my special guest tonight is no other than Dave Julie Hoka. Donnelly. I hope I pronounced it well. <laughs> Thank you. Right. She is the director general. She's not just a director. Director general of the National Agency for the Prohibition of Trafficking in Persons. A lot of people don't know any other business than to sell human beings, which is like second slavery. So we're selling people into slavery. Could you kindly just briefly introduce yourself, tell us your background before we go into what you do? I'm Dame Julia Kadonli. I'm a lawyer by profession, a chartered secretary and administrator, a chartered arbitrator as well, and a certified auctioneer. Um, I am the director general of NAPTIP. I was appointed in 2017 um, by His Excellency President Muhammadu Buhari, and um, I'm there right now. 
as VG. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, can you tell us a bit about growing up? You know, what so that we can see what prepared you for this difficult task. Your primary school. Um, I grew up. I was born and brought up in Lagos. I attended um, Command Children's School. Yeah, but uh, my dad was a naval officer. Uh, my mom was a business in Amadou Bello University, Zaria. Um, growing up was very strict. My dad, my parents, both of them actually were very, I don't even know, between my dad and mom. I, I think my mom was even stricter than my dad, who was a naval officer. And um, I think that really um, made me to be very, very disciplined and time conscious. If you tell me to come somewhere at 2 o'clock, you can be sure I'll be there at 1. I'll just start hiding, you know, <laughs> so that you don't, you know, until it's around time. So, it's, so um, it really helped me a lot. And I think being a lawyer, um, an ad administrator also really prepared me for this job without even knowing. And then most importantly, I'm very passionate about, you know, um, the rights of human beings generally, men, women, boys and girls. I just can't stand any form of violence on any. Anyone, you know, if 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 I see something, Ted's birthday, I launched my first book called Parenting in the 21st Century. I, I, I apparently God was preparing me for this job without me even knowing, because what was my book talking about? I was practically talking about how to protect children, boys and girls, from being abused. And in my job, we find all sorts of children, children being abused, boys, girls, raped you know, violently beaten, killed, and all of that, you know. So I, I think um, my job was was divine, if you ask me. I, I have a, um, a foundation, and uh, awareness campaign was in NACTIP. I did not know that I was going to go back to NACTIP. <laughs> it was just wow. so, 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 yeah. yeah. So, yes. Was it possible that we celebrated that time? <laughs> wow, I would have thought you are about 40 plus now. Well done. Well Thank done. You. Sure, that is why the only place we ever met was at the airport, you know. <laughs> and wherever I go in the world, I cry. Some people will come to me, walk up to me at the airport, they are stranded. In fact, one night we were flying out of London Heathrow Airport on Virgin Atlantic. And just as we were about to board, so the security guys stopped us and said they needed to take in a deportee. They were deporting a lady. And suddenly all hell broke loose. The lady who was sitting quietly before started noise. No, I'm not going. I have HIV. You people have infected me. Hey, come and see commotion in the airport. You know, what you've been dealing with. Could, could you tell first the primary objective of your agency? We are here to prevent all forms, all forms of sexual and gender-based violence, which includes rape, but it is only applicable within the FCT, um, while other states are meant to to domesticate the act. But now, talking about human trafficking, which is a federal law and applicable in all 36 states, our mandate is to prevent human trafficking by carrying out sensitization campaigns, which we do practically all over Nigeria, uh, by arresting and prosecuting, and by rescuing victims of trafficking, rehabilitating them, empowering them, and reuniting them back into the society. So if you like, I'll say that our mandate is like law enforcement, and it also has some humanitarian aspects to angle to it as well. It's a very unique agency because we're the only agency, you know, that has, the, the, you know, such a mandate to, you know, uh, arrest on one hand, to understudy us, and to go back to see if they can do exactly what we're doing. Because we, we have a holistic approach, you know, to the fight against human trafficking. But what is your definition of human trafficking? Now, human trafficking can be defined as the acts, you know, to recruit, 
Because first of all, there's a recruitment to start with. The act to recruit somebody through different means, either by deceit, which is very common, by abduction, by lies, by force, with the aim of exploiting them. Now, exploitation can be in the form of sexual exploitation for the purpose of forced prostitution, forced labor, domestic servitude, organ harvesting, and so on and so forth. So yes, there must be the act itself, you know, which is to really receive them, somebody harbors them, then of course the exploitation starts for the purpose of, of course, making money. So that is basically, you know, simply put, that is human trafficking. Exploiting them, their human rights and all of that. I've seen a lot of documentaries, I think, on CNN and uh, possibly Al Jazeera. Uh, that it, this is common in some particular states. Is that right? And what do you think is responsible? I would say it used to be common in the South-South, especially in the Edo states back in the days. But now... All 36 states are endemic when it comes to human trafficking. I'll tell you the history of Edo State. Back in the days, girls used to... So girls were living on their own. Unfortunately, the mafia saw that this is big business, and they took it over. Unknown to those who are now coming up, they had seen the big houses that the former big girls had built, but they, they thought it was business as usual, not knowing that the mafias have taken it over and it is now human trafficking. So you now, mean the Italian mafia now or the Nigerian mafia? Italian, Nigerian, they are all in it together. They have now taken it over. It's now they saw it was big business and they now converted it into human trafficking. So now these girls going, believing that they are going to prostitute. Some of them actually know or believe they are going to prostitute, which is fine because it is legal. But unfortunately. That is not the case because they are forced into prostitution. Now, being a prostitute is different from being forced into prostitution because if you're a prostitute, you call the shots. You prostitute on your terms and every penny comes into your pocket. But when you're into forced prostitution, you are working for someone else who takes every penny from you. That's the difference. So, and that is when it becomes trafficking because your rights are taken away from you and you're under the control of someone who is exploiting you for his own purpose. So, you are saying all 36 states are now involved. So, how are you able to track members of this mafioso? Now, you know, the crime of human trafficking is one that is clandestine in nature, in the sense that it is usually done kind of behind closed doors. And most of the time, we rely on intelligence, you know, people reporting. And then, of course, sometimes we go out and then we escape, you know, places. Of course, basically based on intelligence that something like this is going on. And then we send officers to go and check. And, of course, we, mostly on reports, Facebook, all kinds of reports are useful to us. So when we get reports like that, of course, we go after the traffickers. We arrest them. We rescue the victims and we prosecute Problems we have sometimes, challenges, is the girls are usually sometimes scared. And they are threatening to put it on Facebook, put it on social media. They, they tell these girls, they threaten them with death. I'm going to, you know, we know where you live, we know your family's juju. This oath, they swear an oath, you know, take their nails and their hair. And unfortunately, these girls believe in things like this. And so when they go through these rituals, they just believe that if they, ex if they escape or if they divulge information to the law enforcement agencies, something would happen to them. They'll run crazy or they'll die. So there are so many challenges, you know, when it comes to that. But yes, that's... Uh, but we are still uh, making our moves. We are still arresting. We are still prosecuting. Uh, and we're getting some convictions anyway. Wow. It must be a very difficult job. So, but don't you think we should blame partly, not totally, our immigration? Because it is actually very possible for the immigration to very easy 
and people say our borders are very porous. So well, it's very for people to go out, you go to the airport, see that people still escape, even with fake documents, with all kinds of things, they still go. Well, for me, I do not want to discuss the immigration services. What I would say on my part is that um, NAPTIP officers are trained to identify potential victims of trafficking and traffickers. I'm not sure immigration officers are trained to identify because that is not their primary mandate. The primary mandate of the immigration services is to check the passports and visas. And once you have a passport to our job, I believe that human trafficking will be reduced to the barest minimum because we will stop those who have really have no business going from going. Okay, so right now you don't have your guys at the airport. No, we don't. The agencies at the airport. Is it not possible this week? Instead of everybody lining up, Nigeria today, I believe the, 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 the number of agencies at the airport must be the highest in the world. I've traveled everywhere and I've never seen anywhere where you have like 10 agencies all lined up and all asking questions. And most times, it, it corrupts the people. Instead of doing the job, you see the guys begin to beg for money. Yeah, you see, for me, what, what I will say is this. I'm not going to compare the world in terms of technology. They are, far be, they are far ahead of us, so I'm not going to start comparing myself. This is a very serious situation, and we just have to do what it takes you know, to bring it to the barest minimum. We can't keep comparing ourselves with other countries and trying to copy other countries because we are really not on the same level. So we need to look at the local situation and come up with a local solution. So for me, the local solution will be the relevant agencies that, that should be there. Not all agencies are relevant, really. But for now, when it comes to human trafficking in Nigeria, NAPTIP is a very relevant agency and not just every agency. And I think we should look at it from that perspective. You see, if you say we're peculiar, part of our peculiarity is that our people don't do their jobs. Once they post you to the airport, you'll be what it did before. You see, that's the, that's the issue. Nigeria is the only place where you have a DSS inside the counter. When you land, you, you go there. From there, you go to a Immigration. Then when you are going now, you meet customers, you meet air force, you meet police, you meet this. You see, it, it makes life difficult, and in a way than you know putting people physically. That's what I'm saying. Are we not able to take advantage of technology? There must be a way to track these people without having ten people in the airport. When we get to that bridge, we can cross it. But right now, we don't have the technology for that. I mean, for me, nothing stops us you know, from even being at the counter. So we don't even need to go through that long a long um, 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 queue. If we're also at the counter there and then, we know whether this person is, is a potential victim or not, and we send her back. So she doesn't even need to go and queue. It's just coming to the counter, yes, sorry, you know, and that's it. So the idea, there will be easier ways of doing it when, if we are there, we'll one would have thought that there was going to be a very long queue because of the protocol. But funny enough, it is even more organized now, and you don't even spend so much time even checking in. It has made it so short. So, yeah, there, there are different ways um, I think we can achieve, you know, cutting time. One is the fear of death. If things ever return to normal, <laughs> you will be shocked. <laughs> how will we all return to our bad ways? Anyway, uh, let, let's leave that. Are there specific countries that you are targeting in in this fight? You've mentioned oh. Italy. So other countries, a few had. Oh. Let me let me talk about practical examples and experience. I'll tell you that all the countries countries are endemic when it comes to human trafficking. Um, it depends on um, what they are trafficking. Uh, for example, the Middle Eastern countries, when you talk about domestic servitude, 
Yes, and I believe um, there will also be elements of organ harvesting going on there. Um, we're also looking at um, Europe, for example, more for forced prostitution, um, trafficking for forced prostitution in West African countries as well, uh, trafficking for forced uh, prostitution and domestic servitude. So, yes, I mean, all the countries, all the countries are endemic, West African countries, East Africa. It's a global phenomenon. It's a global, global phenomenon. Every country is uh, guilty of human trafficking. So what are, what are your biggest challenges at the moment? Well, to be honest with you, my biggest challenge is the fact that uh, the destination countries always want to make it look like it's a Nigerian problem. And I tell them, no, it's not a Nigerian problem. It's a global problem. For example, you say, oh, Madam DG, um, there are these two guys uh, who we suspect are traffickers. Um, we want you to investigate them and see how you can process to keep them. And I say, sorry, who are they working about this, you know? So, you know, the lack of sharing of information. Most of these countries, they don't share information. They don't share information mm. with them. They don't know what they are doing when it comes to uh, uh, prosecuting traffickers. We don't know who they've prosecuted, how many they've prosecuted, if any, you know? They, uh, this, there's this lack of mutual legal assistance um, or, or both uh, from, on their side. Then there's, you know, there's this just lack of lack of trust, lack of sharing information. That is a major important thing there, you know. So they make it look like it's a Nigerian problem. Whereas if you ask me, the destination countries are the ones that really are, are, are the problem because the Nigerians, they live from the country of origin, which is Nigeria, and they end up in the destination countries where they are forced into prostitution, forced into organ harvesting, forced into domestic uh, servitude. All the money is being made there. By the time these girls come back, they are wretched. Most of them are sick and almost dying. Most of them already have diseases. They can't even live long. They can't live a normal life any longer. You know, so it's, 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 a, it's a very, very serious problem, you know, for us. It has been alleged that Nigeria and Nigeria, of which we are a part of, uh, is fond of abandoning its citizens abroad when they are in trouble. Uh, is, is this allegation true? Well, I really don't know what anyone means by abandoning their citizens. Uh, what I'll tell you is this. In the last three years since I became DG, Nigeria has brought back thousands from all over the world, especially victims of trafficking. Let me restrict it to victims of trafficking. Perhaps someone else who is in charge of just uh, regular migrants or non-migrants can speak for themselves. But I'll, really, I'll, I'll narrow it down to victims of trafficking. Uh, we've been working very closely with the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs, um, with the EU-IOM Joint Initiative, and we've brought back so many girls from everywhere. And it's, it's, a, it's a work in progress. It's not a one-off thing, because we are talking about massive sensitization campaigns. But these girls, for whatever reason, some of them for greed, you know, who just think that, you know, when they flash money in their faces and tell them they're going to be paying them so much money, they just jump at it. And then because I tell you what, there were some girls that came back from um, Lebanon like two weeks or three weeks ago, about 125 of them. And I went to see them, you know, where they were, they, they, they were kept, you know. And I asked the question. I said, look, I really want to know if my officers are not doing their job. Were you aware or were you not aware that trafficking is going on? And they said, well, they heard about it, but they didn't know that it was happening in Lebanon. So these are the problems, you know, we have. Where these girls, we go, they get themselves trafficked, and at the end of the day, they start shouting and screaming, you know, Nigerian government has abandoned me, they are not doing anything. It's very annoying, you know, because it is cheaper for them to stay in Nigeria and use that money that they are giving to the these fake agents to do a business here than for Nigerian government to start spending so much money bringing them back. Especially aim that anybody abandons them anywhere. Nigerian government is doing a lot to bring them back and spending so much money. Uh, but uh, one of the reasons I came to you and I contacted you was because of a specific situation we have in Lebanon. And I'm sure you are aware of that. I had tried to get information from my good friend, uh, Madame Abike Dabiri Erewa. 
And then she said, well, she didn't have much information about what was going on in Lebanon. So it was from her. I then came to you again. What is happening in Lebanon? Can you speak about the situation in Lebanon? Because that video has gone viral. We see Nigerians sleeping on their floor, and they've been there for weeks, if not months. Okay, you see, the problem with us is that um, we are very judgmental. And um, because of this social media, everybody just flashes whatever and, you know, takes it without looking at the situation on ground. Nigeria Embassy, we do not have who are running away from their slave masters. That's the question we should be asking. We don't have shelters. Now, these girls escape from their slave masters, and then the ambassador is able to get somewhere for them to just stay while we are working on bringing them back, because we are working on bringing them back. Now, they get very impatient, and they start screaming and expecting magic overnight. It doesn't work that way. There's a protocol. There's a procedure. Before they come back, they must be given emergency travel certificates. None of them there is ready to spend their money to buy tickets to come back. Now, if you cannot use your money to buy tickets to come back, then you have to be patient for us to put our plans in place to bring you back, which is what we are doing. You know, so that's exactly the problem now. About 150, not just these 30 girls you're seeing, about 200, actually about 210 girls right now have been profiled to be returned. We're working on the logistics. It's not easy, you know. So that's... Okay. So what is your connection with uh, the different states in Nigeria, the governor, government of the states? Uh, maybe what you need to do is identi identify where they come from and then link up with their state government. That's why I'll be talking to uh, the lady from or you, just after your interview, because I, I can see that your state has been quite proactive. They are trying to bring back their own citizens. But to be unfortunate, if a your state picks their own citizens and then abandon citizens from other states. So how do you think? NAPTIP is federal government, so we don't go selecting states. When we are repatriating, we repatriate everybody and handpick their indigents because we bring everybody. So that's a way to partner. And what, uh, uh, what else I'll, what, uh, I'm going to say again is this. We have states um, that have the anti-human trafficking task forces. Oyo State is not one of them. We are trying to set up the Oyo State um, anti-human trafficking task force, and then we hope that the SSA is going to facilitate that. Right now, we have five states who, are, who have anti-human trafficking task forces, and, and they are working very closely with NAPTIP. The idea of having a state task force is to liaise with the federal government, which is NAPTIP, for easy coordination and cooperation. States start traveling all over the place to pick out their citizens or their indigents when Nigerians are in one place. For example, we have Odo, Oyo, Ogu, Lagos, like that. If they come together and decide to get planes to bring you know, to evacuate these girls in conjunction with the federal government. The federal government is bringing two planes. They are bringing two planes or one plane. We can work that way in a more coordinated manner. You know, they, we need synergy. We need cooperation. So that's what I would say. So that's why it's very important for all these states to have the anti-human trafficking um, task forces. But for COVID-19, we were meant to go to nine states this year, Ogun State or your state inclusive. And I hope that um, very soon she'll be able to give us an appointment so, so that we can set up and train the task force. Because the head of the task force is meant to be the attorney general of the state because of prosecutions, while the, 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 the co-chair is the zonal commander of NACTIP. That is the way it is structured. And of course, the SSAs on human trafficking and whatever can be members of the task force. That is the way it's structured. So we hope that all your state, since they are very, uh, so that we can work in a more coordinated manner going forward. Wow. I don't envy your job at all. Because head or tail, 
people are going to complain, you know. And I, I know you very well to be a very strong woman. And uh, I pray that you will continue to have the strength. Uh, but I think there must be a way, there must be a synergy between the federal government and the state because you can't do it alone. It's obvious that the federal government lacks the capacity to do it alone. Well, except if you have any other thing that uh, you want to tell our viewers, I think uh, you've actually explained it to us. Well, I would want to say, I would not like to use the word federal government lacks capacity. I would like to say that the fight against human trafficking is a, is a fight that involves the whole of society and the whole of government. The whole of government, uh, uh, federal government, the state government, the local government, the media, the CSOs, the NGOs, the faith-based organizations, everybody, every single soul in Nigeria has a role to play. And then uh, on parting out, I'd like to say that um, when women, men, girls, boys are offered jobs, please, it will not cost you anything to confirm from nothing. It is cheaper to ask a simple question than to abandon you. It doesn't cost you anything to ask a simple question. You can... And you can reach us. Just type a simple question and we'll respond. Thank you. Thank you, madam. God bless you god bless you it's good to see you again on uh, on this platform and uh whenever we also have information we'll 